Emmanuel Bible College has a slogan, We do different. As Christians in general, too, we do different. Romans 12, 2 advises us, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. But that difference, that non-conformity, may make us stick out like sore thumbs. And visible differences draw criticism. Ministerial this past week, our host shared a book in which one of the fishing tips the author offered churches was connect with culture. One illustration featured a, a blackboard sidewalk display on which this clergy person wrote, We don't do guilt. Apparently this held appeal to some who had never attended or quit going to church. But if you don't do guilt, what do you do with all the Bible's teachings about sin? Does all that just get tossed out the window so you're left with only those passages that seem non-judgmental? If there's no such thing as sin, who needs a savior? Lately I've been feeling increasingly out of step with culture rather than connecting with it. Some examples in EFC webinar about pornography related that 52% of men feel it's okay to view porn. Uh oh, that's a, a pathway into a multi-billion dollar industry that victimizes and objectifies women and destroys souls. Recently, one of our country's political parties resolved to remove opposition to same-sex marriage from its platform, even though several biblical passages are against such practice. And this week on Parliament Hill, there's our PM raising the rainbow flag. Even heterosexual marriage is being snubbed, Jesus said in Luke 20, 34. The people of this age marry and are given in marriage. Yeah. Stats Canon tells us in the 10 year period from 2001 to 2011, married couples dropped from 70.5% to 67%, just two thirds of all census families. In contrast, the proportion of census families that were common law increased from 13.8% to 16.7% during the same period. And this week, headlines in science contain the news that. The Rosetta Orbiter has detected some of the molecular building blocks for life on a comet, uh, comet, bolstering the theory that life on Earth could have been seeded by a small solar system body. Still quite a leap to get from a single amino acid to self-replicating cells, but non-theists grasp at anything that would avoid the sort of accountability inherent in the biblical creation narrative. The more our biblical worldview clashes with the secular one, the more we can expect questions, criticism, sarcasm, even to be made the fun of jokes. Jesus had his critics, too, those who operated under different theological assumptions. After his triumphal entry into Jerusalem and subsequent clearing of the temple, he came under attack from a variety of groups. In Luke 20, verse 1, it's the chief priests, teachers of the law, or scribes, and elders. In 2020, there are spies, as Matthew 22:15 tells us, sent by the Pharisees and Herodians. In 2027, come the Sadducees, and Matthew tells us these are followed by the Pharisees. Everyone is trying to pick holes in this upstart rabbi from Galilee. Today we're focusing on the episode with the Sadducees, who we'll call con men. Controlling, confining, condensing, and compromising. Well, that's also almost a con. Controlling. The Sadducees controlled the high priesthood and held the majority of seats in the Sanhedrin. Confining. They figured life is all there is. They didn't believe in the resurrection or the afterlife. Harvey already used my joke about that's why they're so sad. <laughs> <laughs> Condensing. They accepted only the first five books of the Hebrew scriptures, the Pentateuch, and rejected the oral tradition taught by the Pharisees. Kind of like Thomas Jefferson, who went through and edited out all the miraculous and supernatural parts of the Bible, uh, assuming an editorial right on oh, God and compromising. They were an aristocratic, politically minded group willing to compromise with secular and pagan leaders. Let's make a deal. 
since they figured this life is all there is, and like he who dies with the most toys wins, they were out to make a buck or two, as much as they could. And since they profited from the selling of animals and exchanging of money at the temple, because they were in the control, remember, they wouldn't have taken kindly to Jesus clearing its courts. In some ways, they're representative of many in our culture today who likewise assume this life is all there is. Naturalism holds that the only reality is what you can see and feel, none of this spirit world business. There is the expression YOLO, that may be new to some of you. YOLO means, who knows, you only live once, which can become an excuse giving permission to do all sorts of things. Our naturalist friends may look oddly at us Christians when we hold back from engaging in activities which to them seem pleasurable and appealing. If it feels good, do it. As long as it doesn't bother the horses, sort of thing. Holding back may draw criticism, or at least heckling and uncom uncomfortable jibes. What's the matter? You too good for us? The Apostle Paul tried to prepare the church at Corinth for walking a different path than their orgy-loving neighbors. He conceded that if there was no such thing as physical resurrection, Christianity is a waste of effort. 1 Corinthians 15. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, so is your faith. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Or as you might hear today, party hearty. So be prepared for con men in your life. Not Sadducees, maybe, but people who come from different backgrounds that may not have heard of Christianity or just don't accept the Bible's account of Jesus' resurrection. How are you going to explain that his being raised makes such a difference? The Sadducees came to Jesus with a question, though it was a bit contrived and convoluted and it takes six verses to unpack. Luke 20, 28 to 33. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife with no children, the man must marry the widow and have children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers and a very long lived woman. The first one married a woman and died childless. The second and then the third married her, and in the same way the seven died, leaving no children. Finally, the woman died too. Now then, at the resurrection, whose life will she be since the seven were married to her? Seriously? What would be the odds of this actually happening? You can tell by the format it's more of a theoretical question, hypothetical than actual. Perhaps it was a, a stock in-house joke that the Sadducees told amongst themselves to have a good laugh at the Pharisees and <coughs> their belief in a resurrection. Their starting point was correct. A bit about a man in Israel having to marry his brother's widow in order to have children who would inherit the brother's property and carry on the family name. Deuteronomy 25, 5. Your brothers are living together and one of them dies without a son. His widow must not marry outside the family. Her husband's brother shall take her and marry her and fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to her. That kind of keeps the, the property and the name going. But after that point, all common sense flies out the window as Jesus' challengers push the story to an absurd conclusion. Would you agree they seem a tad insincere? Are they trying to have a joke, a good laugh at the teacher's expense? Remember, these are pragmatists we're talking about here, hard-nosed <coughs> businessmen who have little use for complex religious teaching. In our day, there may be many types of questions raised by skeptics. They may be trying to have a joke at our expense. They may be sincere. Or they may be insincere, not really wanting or expecting an answer, which is a kind of expect case of the Sadducees. Or their question may be a smokescreen covering up deeper issues. Can I trust you? 
I've been hurt by a church folk in the past, stuck up SOBs, and I need to know if you're going to knife me like they did. A skeptic by their question may be testing us to see A, our, our intellectual capability, can we make a reasonable defense of our faith? Peter 3.15 But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. The skeptic may also be testing us to determine, B, will you take me seriously? If you don't have an answer off the top of your head, are you willing to take some time and do some digging in order to help me with a question that is important to me? The website CARM.org, Christian Apologetics and Research Ministry, lists several questions skeptics commonly ask. Here is a sampling. Would you be ready to offer some reply to these? Just kind of get thinking about these and check out the website if you want to know where they go. Since the New Testament writers were biased, can we trust what they wrote? Hasn't the Bible been rewritten so many times it can't be trusted? If there is a good God, why is there evil and suffering in the world? What type of God would kill the firstborn of Egypt? If God knew people would sin, why did he make them? Why is Jesus the only way to heaven or God? What makes you think Christianity is the only way to God? Why do you believe in Jesus, but not Santa Claus? I believe in reincarnation, so why do I need Christianity? It's just the same. Good questions to think about and ponder how you'd answer if a skeptic asked you. Is your faith sturdy enough to withstand some scrutiny? What Bible passages might be helpful to refer to or even have memorized? We noted the Sadducees' questions seem disingenuous, fake, hokey, insincere. But what's interesting is Jesus' response. He actually answers their question. He doesn't blow them off, say, and walk away muttering, I created the world and knowledge and the human mind. Come back another day when you have a serious question. No, he deals with them where they are on their terms. Notice, he meets them where they're at. They only accept the first five books of the Bible. Where is Jesus quote from? Exodus 3, verse 6, second book of the Bible, one they would or they should accept as authority. When Paul is preaching to the people of Athens in Acts 17, to what writings does he refer? He doesn't lay on them John 3.16, it hasn't even been written yet. Acts 17.23 says, As far as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. He started with something written in their midst on a pagan altar. What else? 17.28 for in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. These are quotes from the Cretan poet Epimenides and the Cilician poet Eratus. Paul started where the people were at. Jesus met the Sadducees on their terms, but he didn't leave them there. He plugged the gaps in their understanding, supplying new information. Luke 20, 34 to 36. Jesus replied, The people of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of taking part in that age and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage, and they can no longer die, for they're like the angels. Here he's challenging them to expand their appreciation of what God has revealed. You may recall another thing the Sadducees disputed was whether angels existed. Jesus, who alone came from the Father's right hand in heaven, who here pulls back the curtain a bit and gives us a privileged glimpse of the afterlife, something only one who came from there and or who made it could know. Married people, note marriage is only for this age, not the next. If your spouse is a believer, you would be able to recognize them and be acquainted with them in heaven, but the relationship won't have a physical connection and exclusivity like it does now. 
enjoy it now. Now, this is quite a contrast to Islam, where between the Quran and Hadith sayings, um, devout men are promised. Anybody know how many virgins in paradise they're promised? 72. Yes. Abounding sexual pleasure and so on. That unfortunately becomes a common motivator for suicide bombers. That's not the Christian hope. So Jesus answers the seven husbands whose wife is she conundrum. He doesn't stop there. He goes on to confront the Sadducees' deeper issue. What's at stake more fundamentally? The resurrection itself. This life is not all there is. He would prove that in his own person after his crucifixion. Acts 1-3, of course, after his suffering, he showed himself to these men, apostles, and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. But that's not happened yet. He's standing in front of the Sadducees, face to face with them, here was him who had the power of eternal life in himself. He told Martha just before raising Lazarus from the dead in John 11.25 I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Of course the Sadducees for the Sadducees he can't show them something that hasn't happened yet his own resurrection. So he appeals to other evidence. He reaches back into Exodus 3, 6 and parks on a passage that he'd be very familiar with. Luke 20. Um, they are God's children since they are children of the resurrection. In the account of the bush, they didn't use scripture references, like verse numbering in that, because that wasn't invented yet, so this passage goes by the account of the bush. Even Moses showed that the dead rise, for he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for to him all are alive. You see his point. By listing Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God is saying they are all alive to him then and there. The three patriarchs are not dead to him. It comes through more clearly in Mark's version. Mark 12, 26. Now about the dead rising, Jesus says, Have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. The verb tense is present, not past. I was their God, though they're dead now. No. I am their God. Still, they're alive to me. Be a child of God is to be a child of the resurrection. Jesus equates the terms in verse 36, literally. They are God's children being children of the resurrection. Have you let this sink into your core if you're a believer in Christ? I am a child of the resurrection. My life is a line that goes on forever. This earthly life is just the dot at the start of a never-ending line. So it puts a different perspective on things. That dying vehicle, that destroyed house, that cancer spot, these are all just temporary, just things that pass away, here a moment, then gone. But you are forever redeemed, soon to be renewed in a post-death glorious spiritual body in Christ. The funeral this past week featured a song by, uh, written by Jimmy Davis called When It's Roundup Time in Heaven when the John sang at the funeral there which goes like this Who'll be sweet when we meet at Jesus' feet with no heartaches, no pains, no sigh When they comb heaven's plains will they find your name at the great roundup in the sky? Significant question indeed Will they find your name the great round up in the sky implies not everyone gets in automatically Jesus suggests as much in verse 35 but those who are considered worthy of taking part in that age and in the resurrection of the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage how do you know if you're considered worthy 
Does it depend on the cleverness of our apologetics? What smart answers we can come up with when defending Christianity? Is it like the Muslim view, here in the graphic, uh, where good deeds and bad are weighed on some divine scale? No. For Christians, it's not a sizing up of good or bad deeds. We are sinners in constant need of forgiveness and grace. The good news of the New Testament is that we can be saved and assured of salvation through trusting in Jesus, who died for our sins. John 1, 12. Let's read this one all together. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. One time Jesus used little children as an example of trusting faith rather than earned merit. Mark 10. Jesus said, The little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter. It's not for the con men, those who are controlling, confining, condensing, compromising, but for those who put their soul confidence in Jesus' love for them and his sacrifice to Christ. That is enough for you to be considered worthy. As Babe Ruth approached the twilight of his career, he was playing in Cincinnati. He was now striking out more often than getting hits, and his play had deteriorated to the point that he was actually getting booed by fans. On one such occasion, after striking out, Babe was walking dejectedly back to the dugout amidst the boos of the crowd. Suddenly, a small boy, tears running down his face, ran onto the field and threw his arms around Babe's legs. Ruth smiled at the boy, reached down and took him into his arms, talking to him as they continued to the dugout. The booing ceased. The crowd was so touched by this spectacle that they silently stood in tribute. We're both characters in that story in a way. Jesus wants us to throw our arms around him and receive him like that little boy. Yet we're also the player getting booed for our failure. Well, God runs after us like the father after the prodigal son, sweeping us up in grace despite our faults. Sweeping us up to be at home with him forever in resurrection home. Let's pray.